a fitting line in that song, but the one who ho- feeds the sparrow is the one who stands by me. A good reminder today. All right, well, if you're following along in your Bibles today, or on your phone, or on the wall, you, whatever way you decide to follow along in the Scriptures, I invite you to turn to the book of James today. Now, we've taken a bit of a hiatus from James. It's been a while. I look back, it was mid-November when we got out of, we had started here in the book of James, made it to chapter 3, and, and then we stopped for Advent and the Christmas season. And um, I'd have to say, I mean, I'd say we got off track, but not in a bad way. I, d- I actually really enjoyed preaching through the Advent season and, uh, and into Christmas. I enjoyed the Christmas message this year. Um, sometimes, sometimes the holiday season is a challenge. That might sound silly, but, but you're preaching on the same event every year at Christmas time. So at times it's like, what am I going to do different? How am I going to put a twist on this? So I'm not saying the same thing over and over, but but overall, I thought this year went well, and I did enjoy it. But, but I'm glad to be back in the study, um, to be in the study of James. So we're going to be in chapter 3 today. But let, let's open with a word of prayer, and then, then we'll get, dive right into that. Heavenly Father, I thank you today, Lord, as we get prepared to get into your word. Father, as, as we prepare ourselves, Lord, I pray that each one here could lay aside distractions, Lord, could put aside whatever it is that the, may have been troubling them this morning, or maybe in the days leading up to this, Lord. We know that the devil seeks to distract us, Lord, especially when we're preparing ourselves to hear the word, when we're preparing ourselves to try to learn, to try to, to glean as much as we can, Lord, and especially when we try to put into practice what we learn. So, Father, I just pray this morning that each one here could clear their mind, Lord, could lay aside whatever it is that may be distracting them, that they could lay it at your feet this morning, knowing that you are in control, or no matter what the situation may be, you are in control. So we give that to you this morning, Lord, and I just pray that a peace would be on each one here as we get into your study. Be with me today, Lord. Help me to speak clearly and boldly for you as always. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So as I said, uh, James chapter 3, and that's where we're going to spend most of our time this morning. Um, I did throw in some Romans this morning, but that's not going to be up there because it's an add-on, but you'll find it, so, and it'll be one you've heard before. So let's start in the book of James. We're going to, James chapter 3, we're going to pick up in verse 13, and the title in my Bible, and probably in some of yours, says, Two Kinds of Wisdom. Two Kinds of Wisdom. Verse 13 Who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life, by deeds done in humility that that comes from wisdom. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness." So what an opening line in that scripture this morning. Of course, if you look back at what we studied before, it's been a long time, but if you were to back up a little bit in James, you would see that we had previously spoken about, and the author had talked about the taming of the tongue. Now, something that, yes, remember, taming the tongue is a never-ending task for us. It's something we're going to work on our entire lives. None of us are ever going to master it. We, we meet individuals sometimes that we think have darn near mastered it, but um, we know we will not reach perfection in this world, so, we, so we're all going to battle that for a long, long time. But knowing the power and the dangers of the tongue, 
that are held within that tiny little muscle inside our mouth, it's easy to see why we would move to this next topic, to wisdom. This is because what is in our hearts, what, what is in our minds, what, what deep down inside it might fester in us for a while, some of us hold things in for a little while, that eventually comes out, well, it eventually comes out by way of the tongue. Now, today, you could just as easily say it comes out by way of the keyboard or the pen or social media or whatever you have you. In, in my book, that's no different than the tongue. Once it's out, it's out. Now, perhaps the only difference is between the tongue and between those other options is for some reason today, we're, we're really more willing to, to put it out there if it's not being spoken audibly for some reason, perhaps because we feel that it gives us some sort of anonymity, and <laughs> it really doesn't, when, when in truth, what, whatever it is that we have put out there, whatever we have, have released into the, the technology world can just as easily and quite frequently come circling back around again and again. It's almost as if it magnifies it. So whether, we, whether or not we put it out there and what we put out there boils down to wisdom, whether or not we have it, whether or not we're using it. Someone would say it boils down to wisdom or perhaps a lack thereof. Verse 13 said, who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life by deeds done in humility that comes from wisdom. Who is wise among you? What a question. Anyone want to answer that? It's not one anybody's jumping to throw their hands in the air on. Many of us might think ourselves wise, but when it comes right down to it, right down to having to put it out there, we become shy about it. Of course, godly wisdom isn't necessarily something that we're going to brag about out loud. And that's for a reason, as we're going to see. It is more of something that is shown rather than told. This question that the author asks here of, of who is wise among you isn't necessarily, he's not necessarily waiting for a response. He's, he's not expecting them to write back and give him a list of, of who thinks they're wise in his audience. But instead, he's prepping his audience with this question. He's prepping them for the follow-up. He's saying, those of you who feel that you are wise or have been told that you possess wisdom, that's who he's speaking to. Now, remember also that wisdom is not simply being smart, intellectually smart or book smart, however you want to say it is completely separate from having wisdom. And, and that, that, that's not to be mean, but it's very true. I've met people that, that were educated so far beyond what we could even think that you would possibly need for education in this world. And yet, there was a definite lack of wisdom and of, and of common sense. Well, those two are quite the same thing, but, but they, they can be lacking even when we are incredibly smart, as we would say, very little ability to discern what to do in a difficult situation. Wisdom is separate from education. So the two aren't the same. I don't want you to think of them the same, but at the same time, the two together can be very powerful. The two together can do great work, but they are not the same thing. Now, he says, of those who feel they are wise and understanding, let them show it by their good life. By deeds done in humility, there's that humility, that's why we're not going to brag about it. Humility that comes from wisdom. Our lives will reflect wisdom. They will be full of actions, deeds, and decisions that stem from wisdom. They will come in humility, not in boasting. Wisdom will compel us to act as prompted by the Holy Spirit. Wisdom does not and will not tell us to take action in order to gain attention or to acquire bragging rights of sorts. 
Now, perhaps some of you can, can think of, of those you've met throughout the years, someone you have encountered in your life and thought of as truly wise, maybe a really wise, humble person. And, and I know there's, when I think of that, there, and I think of, of somebody with godly wisdom, there's people that come to my mind that I've met over the last 40 years that just instantly come to mind. Now, hopefully each of you know somebody or has somebody in mind that way. No, I didn't say perfect, somebody that's perfect, because we have to be careful not to put these individuals, because these individuals can, can mean a lot to us in this life. They, they, we can learn from them. Hopefully, we gain wisdom from them. But at the same time, we have to be careful not to put them up on a pedestal so high because it sets us up for disappointment. Because after all, these individuals are human. They have flaws, just like you and I have flaws. They make mistakes. They struggle with the same temptations that you and I struggle with. They're human. But at the same time, you can, they can have great wisdom because of where wisdom comes from. But most of us know or have known someone that has lived very much this verse who spoke softly and sparingly but when they did speak, you listened because you wanted to hear what they were going to say. You wanted to be filled with that wisdom. You wanted to receive it because you knew that person possessed that heavenly wisdom. Someone who truly deserved to be bragged about a little, but would never hear of it because they were humble, never self-seeking. That, that's that's where we find one source of wisdom, how one source of wisdom is handled. But the Scripture here tells us there's two kinds of wisdom, which come from polar opposite places. Take a look at the next couple of verses that we had this morning. Verses 14 and 15 says, But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom, it has in quotation marks there, does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder in every evil practice. It says such wisdom does not come from heaven, but is earthly. Notice the quotations there. I don't know if it has them up there, but in, in my Bible, it has it in quotation marks. A person claiming to be wise, yet harboring bitterness and selfish ambition, who denies the truth, they possess a false wisdom, if you will. Sure, they'll tell you they're wise. They'll tell you how smart they are. But it is a worldly wisdom. As, as I was looking up the notes to prepare this message, I found one. And I found something that I thought it summed up wisdom quite nicely, actually. And it says, wisdom. It says, enables one to face trials with pure joy. Wisdom is not just acquired, just acquired information, but practical insight and spiritual implications. That is not the kind of wisdom being spoke of here in verse 14. This is earthly wisdom. A false bravado does not come from the Father, nor does it come from any heavenly source. No, it comes from the Father's most sinister adversary and his minions. Verse 15 said, such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. So, brothers and sisters, you, you are watching a worldwide picture right now. You don't have to look very far to see what we're reading here, the difference between the two being played out as clear as day before your very eyes. You don't have to look far. You can look at the news, at the papers, at social media. You could probably go to a coffee shop and hear both. 
talk shows, podcasts, and on and on and on. And, and none of these things are bad in themselves, but, but you can, you, if you sit back and look at them through the lens of Scripture, through the lens of truth, you will see both sides. You will see wisdom, heavenly wisdom, and you will see earthly wisdom. You will see both sides of the spectrum. Now, it cannot be denied and we must learn to recognize and discern what we are hearing and seeing. It is, is it wisdom sent from heaven above? A gift from the Holy Spirit that is available to each one of us who truly believes and has experienced an undeniable life change after having put their faith in Jesus Christ and been born again of water and the Spirit? Is that the kind of wisdom we're seeing? That's not to say that, that all who have followed Christ are overflowing with wisdom because it is acquired over time. It is learned over time. It is something we can seek after, something we can learn from the Word of God and gain through study and implementation of His words and by being with people who possess that godly wisdom. Now, what we are witnessing all around us right now is not God's wisdom. It is not spirit-led discernment, and it, is, it has become a huge problem, even in the church of Christ, the, the, as the bigger picture church. Because of the struggle between the two kinds of wisdom, you are seeing communities, families, churches being ripped apart because they're such, excuse me, polar opposites. You are seeing lives ruined and young people being led astray into places physically and mentally that we could have never comprehended just a few years ago. It's like something out of a horror movie, but it's real. And it's because the two, the two don't go together. As we grow closer to the time of Christ's return, that, that part's only going to get worse. There is going to be an even larger gap between the two. And that's by design, of course. Verse 15 said, for, wh for, when, for where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you will find disorder and every evil practice. This should sound familiar. This should cause us to bring to mind someone, perhaps many people, it may even make us think of our own lives. Why do we do what we do? Why do we make the decisions that we make? Why do we take part in the activities that we take part in? Is it for the good of the kingdom, the good of others, to glorify God by what we say and do in this life? Or is it because deep down inside, we're a little bit selfish? Now, that may hurt to think about. I didn't like writing it, but we have to think about that. It may bring up some anger inside of us because we feel like we're being accused all of a sudden when we think about that. Have you ever noticed that, that when we are called out as individuals, when we are confronted with the truth, truth that we know is right, and it points to something that, that deep down we need to change, we tend to get angry. We, we tend to lash out, to fire back, to go into self-preservation mode rather than truthfully looking in to what it is that is stirring up all of that emotion. Now, and everybody reacts to things differently. For me, that's what happens. And I'm sure for some of you it's a change. It's, it's, <laughs> you could dive into the psychology of it, but it's, that's how a lot of people respond in this situation. Trust me, I've been there, done it many times. I'm sure I'll be there again. Why? Because I'm human, because I'm stubborn, and I have a lot of flaws that the Lord is working on. The spirit within me wants to change. It wants to see me grow, become humble and wise, showing discernment, and, and, and in doing so, mirror Christ to those around me at every opportunity. But the flesh which we are stuck with, 
why we're here on this planet, which we are stuck with, the flesh wants none of that. It is deceptive by nature. It clings to the earthly ways, to the earthly wisdom that we heard talked about. It delights in flashes of anger, in outbursts, seeking to cling to whatever little bits of earthliness is left inside of me, inside of each one of us. You see, the flesh was born of sin. And when we were washed clean by the blood of the Lamb, we became a new creation. We were freed from that sin. But until we experience our earthly death, the one we're all waiting for, we will struggle because we paired with this flesh until that glorious resurrection to a new life comes. Until then, we will struggle with this. Now, I've told you before that that this should be no surprise. The Apostle Paul outlined it perfectly, and and we've read this before, but it's worth reading again. And I think when we think of the Apostle Paul, nobody here is going to really argue that he had a lot of wisdom. The God, there was heavenly wisdom flowing out of him. That's why we have so much from him. But yet, he had the same issue. Look at Romans, if you have your Bibles this morning, if you, or if you're on your apps or whatever, look up Romans chapter 7. And I say that because this is a mouthful. I always have trouble getting, reading this without screwing up, and it's good to follow along. Romans chapter 7, verse 7 is where we'll read. And the top says, the law and sin... Starting in verse 7, what shall we say then? Is the law sinful? Certainly not. Nevertheless, I would not have known what sin was had it not been for the law. For I would have not known what coveting really was if the law had not said, you shall not covet. But sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, produced in me every kind of coveting. For apart from the law, sin was dead. Once I was alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin sprang to life and I died. I found that every commandment that was intended to bring life actually brought death. For sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, deceived me and through the commandment put me to death. He says, so then the law is holy and the commandment is holy, righteous and good. Did that which is good then become death to me? By no means. Nevertheless, in order that sin might be recognized as sin, it used what is good to bring about my death, so that through the commandment, sin might become utterly sinful. We know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. I do not understand what I do, This is the Apostle Paul writing this. I do not understand what I do, for what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. That flesh we talked about. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Now if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it. So I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, Evil is right there with me, for in my inner being I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. What a wretched man am I. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. So he knows he's been delivered from this. 
He knows that that deliverance is coming. He knows that he has the Spirit. But at the same time, he knows he's going to struggle with it until death comes. He says, so then I myself, in my mind, am a slave to God's law. But in my sinful nature, a slave to the law of sin. So within you, you have these two sources of wisdom that the Scriptures were talking about this morning. You have our Lord trying to speak heavenly wisdom into our lives, into our minds, and into our hearts so that we act upon that. And within us, we have this other, the worldly flesh, trying to also give us what it refers to as wisdom, worldly wisdom. So we have to discern between the two. And the scriptures from James this morning clearly point out what is going to be the product of listening to one or the other. And as I said, you can see all around you the, what is, happens when, when we choose to follow the earthly wisdom. Now, I know that's a lot of scripture, but I wanted to share it to make a point, to make the point that, that we're going to struggle, and we all will. But it is still possible to do the work of God, to live a life filled with great godly wisdom to impact others, even amidst that struggle. Look at the Apostle Paul. It was that heavenly wisdom that helped him recognize this struggle. That helped him realize the cause. And I'm glad that he did because because it helps me to understand. That's why we have the Word. And look at what the Apostle Paul, what God was able to do through him. I shouldn't say it as if it was just Paul. What the Lord was able to do through Paul because he was receptive to the Holy Spirit. He was receptive to that heavenly wisdom. He used, just like we can use, and we have more than he did, we have the Word of God to align what we feel is that wisdom. When we feel it's being spoke to us, when we feel we're being led in a direction, we have the Word of God to compare it to. Sometimes we do that. We compare and we think, all right, I'm on the right track. I'm going to go this way. Sometimes we compare it and we think, oh, I'm not really ready to go that direction yet. And we wait. Doesn't mean we don't know we're supposed to do it. We have a guide. We have the Holy Spirit. We have the Word of God. We have everything we need to gain wisdom. But we have to be willing. We have to have a willing mind, a willing heart. We have to have self-discipline. Paul's former life as Saul was a perfect example of earthly wisdom. Out of his early life came chaos and death. And yet at the same time, he boldly proclaimed that he was doing this for God. Obviously, that was not from the Lord. We know the source of where that was coming from. But what other life can, can so boldly produce both sides? to give us a contrast to look at. I want to close today with, with, verses, with verses 17 and 18 to give us something to ponder on. It says, But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial, and sincere, peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. If you write nothing else down today, if you underline nothing else, underline verse 18, peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. Let's have a word of prayer today.
Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for the reminder today as we talk about wisdom, Lord, about heavenly wisdom, about earthly wisdom, Lord, and discerning the difference between the two. Father, we use the, the, the Apostle Paul's life, Lord, between being Saul and Paul, the perfect contrast between the two. Starting as one, Lord, being transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit. And then we see Paul emerge. Lord, and we see and we read, we know what you did through him. Father, I know that many of us here, in reality, all of us, Lord, depending on where we're at, our lives mirror that very thing. Maybe we were not a murderer indeed as Paul or Saul was. But we know our minds. We know our hearts. We know where we once were, Lord. We know where we should be. So, Father, I pray this morning for, for each one here, Lord, we would seek that heavenly wisdom. Lord, that as we try to discern, we would use the word of God as our compass. That we would allow that to guide us into your wisdom, Lord. That we would see the fruits that, that accompany that, Lord. That we would see them produced in our lives and in the lives of those around us as a result of it. We know it's possible, Lord. I've seen it. I've seen it in this very group of people, Lord, and I pray that it would continue because it is a daily choice. Lord, help us to sustain that. Help us to choose you daily, to choose heavenly wisdom daily, Lord, to ward off the attacks, Lord, to ward off the distractions, the things that keep us from focusing on you, that keep us from following you intently every day. Father, help us not to be embroiled in, in needless conversations, in, in useless quarrels, as the Scriptures call it, Lord. Help us to be focused on you. Lord, give each one here that strength. Lord, I don't pray just that you protect them. We're so quick to, to pray that, Lord. Not that we don't want protection, Lord, but I pray that you would give them each a boldness. Lord, that you would give them that boldness, boldness, Lord, that desire to know you, Lord, the confidence to know that you walk beside them. Lord, that when we step in faith, as we prayed earlier this morning, Lord, that when we step in faith, you step with us. So I thank you for this today, Lord. We praise you for it. In Jesus' name, amen.